Hello, everyone. Thank you so much for having me. I took a very early flight from uh, Richmond, and uh, I'm still like very tired from moderating a panel last night and a really robust conversation over uh, dinner with Josh McPhee of Interference Archive, um, Jerome Harris, um, who is a teaching fellow at MICA, who initiated the project as not for dethroning our absolutes and my colleague, Tinashe Mushakavanu. And the uh, title of our panel was Futures from Fragments, and I'm going to continue on uh, that note. My word for the conference was was um, obscure. Um, so we were talking about the intersection of design and the archive and thinking about knowledge production and cultural production. Um, I will tell one anecdote about my relationship to type design, um, but I'm not going to show any type design today. Um, I'm going to speak more about what type has done um, in my sort of cultural context. When I was uh, studying at Yale University, I took a class with Tobias Ferrer Jones. It was such an honor. Um, the class went really well. We had to do a revival of a typeface, and um, it was a research-based project, so definitely up my alley. Um, I went into the Divinity School Special Collections Library to look at 18th and 19th century colonial Bibles that were printed um, in our uh, traditional languages, but also I found some uh, Bibles that were printed in pidgin languages, which were some uh, combination of English, Afrikaans, and uh, the, the sort of our um, dialects. And it was such a phenomenal uh, time, just really feeling those objects, redrawing those letter forms. Uh, as Zimbabweans, we don't have any tradition of visual, a visual writing system that comes from our culture. Um, outside of uh, pictograms, we don't have letter forms that are signed um, sounds and then build um, a whole alphabet. So for me, the Roman character is very important, um, and I really spent a lot of time um, luxuriating over uh, the letter forms. Um, come my crit, uh, when I wanted to have a really deep discussion about uh, those Bibles, um, I was met with uh, total silence outside of one critic who told me that uh, he couldn't engage with the work because um, he had so much unresolved guilt about the work because of um, his ancestry and how they were implicated in sort of like colonialism, uh, which was quite fascinating to me um, that uh, my project was so dangerous. And, um, but also it made me think maybe it was so bad that he didn't want to talk about it. Um, it made me really petrified um, you know, to continue on that uh, train of thought. And I really put that investigation aside until 2015 when I met Tinashe Mushakavanu. That project, uh, the project that we built um, out of sort of, con which is connected to that thread, is not a, a type design project, but it's really thinking about uh, what type has been doing uh, within our cultural context, thinking about the initiation of those Bibles that were used to indoctrinate and colonize Zimbabweans. But this image here is taking us further back into history. This is the uh, Murumutapa Kingdom, um, the kingdom of the Roji people. It was started, the construction was started in the 11th century and continued until the 15th century. That was the height of the kingdom until um, uh, we also started to have these encounters and conflicts uh, with the British uh, pushing up into the territory, which is now known as Zimbabwe. Uh, the name of Zimbabwe comes from this space, uh, Zimbabwe, Mabwe, which means house of stone. When we talk about uh, this space now, we call it Great Zimbabwe Ruins. Um, and there's so much literature about this space, not about the actual construction of it, also another who done it. There's so much speculation about uh, this space not being constructed by the Roji, but that uh, some queen from somewhere else, there's a show about the Queen of Sheba, speculation that the Queen of Sheba uh, must have had influence enough to spread a kingdom to this extent, and that this was you know, out of her power and riches and um, wealth. And so our authorship as people has been totally uh, taken away uh, from us, uh, you know, from this, to this extent. Um, the ruins that you see are actually expedited because of a very um, irresponsible excavation uh, projects by German and British um, archaeologists trying to look for signs of anyone else besides uh, the Roji uh, having built this structure. Very little um, has been written about the building itself, which is phenomenal. Um, if you uh, take a look at this image, you can see the footprint of what used to be there, all these uh, 
curved walls were conical structures that were granite bricks that stood on top of each other with no mortar. They're really, really tall, They're probably uh, higher than the screen. Um, just a phenomenal, phenomenal architectural feat. Um, and so it's this, uh, this idea of erasure, erasure of authorship, and a, a desire in myself to trace back um, knowledge about what my peoples uh, have been about to try to construct a more wholesome uh, and whole, a, a fuller identity for myself, and also you know, to pass on to my community, my peers, not only my students. It just became very, very important to me. Uh, reading Zimbabwe also comes out of instances like this. Um, Michael Manderberg, who teaches at CUNY, sent me uh, this Wikipedia article, uh, which shows uh, an instance of a Zimbabwean uh, sculptor uh, that is going to be taken down from Wikipedia. It's going to be it's up for deletion. And just thinking about how this is kind of systematic, uh, that all these repositories, you know, we're, we're producing all this uh, knowledge, we're um, documenting it, we are uploading it in certain places, we're printing it out, uh, but there's instances um, where this content should make people visible and mechanisms of power that uh, starts to remove, uh, you know, remove that, uh, that knowledge from our spaces. So now we get to reading Zimbabwe, really thinking about the idea of reconstruction, laying brick upon brick, um, the design of Great Zimbabwe is not just about what you can do with the stones, but most of the beauty of the space, which I didn't really show you um, the images of the, the design on the top of the structures, a beautiful chevron design, but built out of the spaces, out of the gaps. Uh, Reading Zimbabwe, as much as it is a platform for archiving the published history of Zimbabwe, is also a platform for thinking about what's missing, what is not there, what has been submerged? Why has it been submerged? What has been censored? Um, this is actually an old slide now. I think we have got more books documented on the website. Uh, we try to find instances of, um, of literature. It can, be, uh, it can be fiction. It can be uh, academic publications. There's children's books on here. But really trying to find the bricks uh, that add up to who we are. Uh, initially, we thought we would be documenting work only by Zimbabwean authors, but we found that it was important to incorporate everyone who is writing about Zimbabwe, whose lens have we been uh, framed by, um, who, are, who are we reading uh, ourselves from. Uh, there's a huge power dynamic involved in this. Uh, the project actually begins, uh, we, we started our chronology from 1956, which is the year that um, the first black intellectuals were allowed to publish in English in Zimbabwe. Um, and so everything that was written about us before, all the foremost historians of our nation are from outside, or uh, white Zimbabweans who participated uh, in uh, the space, but uh, not necessarily in the culture, or had a very separate culture to the indigenous population. Um, the numbers that you see on the website tell you how many books exist, but uh, within that there's also um, the ideas of who can access those books, where have they been printed, um, is it for uh, an academic population in the northeast of America, um, are those books available in Zimbabwe, in the bookshops that still exist, um, what has been censored by the Zimbabwean government, what is a narrative that is not popular about us uh, in the west and, and uh, doesn't uh, get published by bookstores out there, uh, what gender are the authors that are writing, what race are they, um, and then where is this writing happening? Um, a lot of this uh, knowledge is being produced out of institutions um, like my own, uh, Virginia Commonwealth University, and where I study Yale University, um, and the distribution uh, circulates among scholars that are outside of the nation. And when we often talk about reading Zimbabwe, um, People try to minimize the project. It's such a local project. It's about this very small country. It reminds me about Jamaica Kincaid's uh, novel, A Small Place. But this uh, website shows us, our accumulation of knowledge um, shows us that there are people in 114 nations that are writing about Zimbabwe. We've also uh, documented instances of translations of uh, Zimbabwean novels. I think there are probably 16 uh, different languages that Zimbabwean uh, literature has been uh, translated into. 
And so we're trying to think about making all of this content visible. We can't uh, give people access uh, necessarily to full publications because of copyright, um, but we're also trying to think of other mechanisms to use in this effort. As we are trying to think about visibility, we're also thinking about categories, labeling and naming, because that is also a way, that is also a framing device. So I'm so serious, I'm very different to <laughs> but I'm as passionate. Um, uh, there's a lot of language uh, that we use for the categories that is specific uh, to our community, but also helps outsiders, um, people that are interested, people that have shared concerns, connect um, and understand how we would like to be uh, talked about, what are our initial concerns, our primary concerns, um, and also how would we frame certain narratives uh, with language. Um, we also try uh, through this to think about uh, language or ideas that our government also doesn't uh, want us to be thinking about, that, don't, that they don't want us to put out in the open. And so things like Kukurahundi, which is um, a massacre uh, that the international community doesn't talk about. It's uh, as devastating as many other ma massacres, uh, you know, tribal conflict that have taken place uh, across the world in, in history. And it's actually much more recent um, after independence in 1982, you know, so very recent, but not talked about. So really trying to also use this archive of literature to push forward uh, things that that have been submerged uh, in history, uh, not just in terms of what people have been studying and writing, writing about in terms of anthropology, because it's not all about that. Um, within the website, I kind of try to be a bit playful. I really enjoy making patterns, and I think about uh, the connection between uh, typography, letter form, uh, modules, pattern making, spaces between things. Um, and so each of the categories, there's some hidden categories on this website. You've got the labels for groups of books, but you also have ideas around anthropology, power structure, um, the arts and things like that. And so you see uh, different ideas here, like this is for agriculture and there's one for religion and currency. Um, you saw sort of the intertwining of some of those before. Uh, this is our author index, uh, thinking about the Wikipedia entry that is going to be deleted. Um, we want to make sure that we make visible the people that uh, authored these texts that we're documenting. Um, oftentimes, this three-line biography that we have on the website is the only instance online that you can find about the writers. Um, it's also uh, thinking about who is uh, valuable enough to be documented? What are we using our time and effort and all of these platforms for? Um, and who is privileged in those spaces? And it's also about um, who has access to those spaces and what do they care about? And now that we have access or the desire to uh, move into this space, we are uh, trying to uh, use it to capture what is relevant and important to us and we feel is a gift to many other people as well. Hopefully this is a model that many communities uh, borrow and, and build on. A patron saint of our um, small budding publishing house, Black Chalk, is Dambuzo Marichera. He was famously expelled from the University of Rhodesia in 1979 for uh, political unrest, for inciting violence. This is language that our government still uses today. Um, and also inspired many of the people who are involved in the movement for democratic change, which is the opposition party that exists uh, to this day. Um, Dombudza Marichera moved to the United Kingdom, got a scholarship from Cambridge University, um, and was also expelled from that university for attempting to burn down the library. Um, Marichera, uh, what did he do? They offered uh, to, to maintain his, uh, his status as a student, but he refused, and um, so they, well, he, they tried to broker a deal and asked him if he would claim insanity and, and go for psychiatric treatment for a little while and that they would allow him back after he went and got assist. And then he, he refused and remained living in the United Kingdom as a squatter. And so you'll see later on the way that we also try to um, think about his work because he was such a contentious and uh, also an eccentric character, he became a dangerous figure, a questioning figure, that once we were independent, uh, an independent nation and he returned to Zimbabwe, he was ostracized, often jailed by the authorities um, because of his voice. Um, and uh, we also champion his work because it has faced uh, a lot of undue censorship. 
Um, I also want to call to attention these publications. Uh, many of these books are from a repository at Yale University. They have the biggest uh, deposit of uh, Zimbabwean literature in vernacular, so in Shona and Debele. Um, also, uh, Shona and Debele are, are two very distinct languages that are kind of creations. Uh, well, I, I speak about Shona because Debele actually stands um, Shona has, is uh, an approximation of uh, different languages that are unique but are related, um, and the British sort of worked uh, to create this uh, approximation as a way to be able to communicate across the board and kind of uh, create one uh, group, the Shona, uh, that would be a bigger mass, a bigger population than the Ndebele. It's like history for you to understand the context of where this is all coming from. Uh, so these uh, publications, uh, live at Yale University, and it is very hard to access them. As an alumni, I have asked uh, to uh, look at these publications. Uh, Black Chalk and Company has approached um, the library uh, to um, work on digitizing the publication so that they can serve our community, because most of the publishers of these books uh, don't even have a single copy left. Uh, you could literally walk into one of the publishing houses and bribe uh, someone that works there for a copy um, if they have it, because they just uh, books have just fallen out of uh, what is important now that we're dealing with such a, so, um, such a huge crisis and we're dealing with bread and butter issues. But nonetheless, we want access to these publications, not so much uh, because they frame us and our ideals, but they really frame what happened to us at a moment in time. All the publications that were produced before uh, 1959 that were authored by black Zimbabweans were not in English, they were in vernacular, and they had to be, it was sanctioned by the Rhodesian um, Literary Bureau that these publications had to be talking about community life in the rural areas, it had to be folklore, it had to be domestic dramas, uh, and had to sort of um, play into a colonial ideal of the native subjects, this is language that is used in, in official documents from that time, and sort of like a diminishing and a skewing of, uh, of uh, cultural identity and a sort of flattening and uh, a space, creating a literary space without uh, a, a sort of um, imagination or aspiration. The book covers are so beautiful, they're so captivating, and I'm now starting to reach out to some of the early illustrators uh, that were connected to Zimbabwe Publishing House and other publishing houses. Um, there's a really wonderful one in Bulawayo that I'm blanking on right now. Um, but most of the illustrators were not uh, black Zimbabweans. And so I also find that quite interesting to think about what sits next to uh, the typography, what's framing, uh, it's not just the you know, the design of the letter forms, but also uh, any other visual material. Uh, these are other instances of Shona books on reading Zimbabwe. The frames are blank because uh, we cannot find instances of these publications online. Uh, we still feel like uh, these books should be represented. We had a huge dilemma thinking that if we can't find all the data, we can't find who wrote it, we can't find uh, what the book looks like, we can't find how many pages, we can't find who published it, we can't find all these things. We have, you know, there's so many inconsistencies, especially with the Shona literature, um, because uh, hardly anyone with power cares to document or save these things or to make them accessible online. Um, but we decided that whatever we could find about uh, these publications, we would uh, put out there. and. That's so important to expose those gaps. We're not sure if uh, these will be filled, but they're there, they're part of the story. It's an example of an author bio and a page that uh, shows the work. Uh, an example of a synopsis of a entry of a book, synopsis review, author uh, bio, and uh, also a status for the publication. So if a book exists as an ebook, we note that. If it's available in Zimbabwe, if it's been censored, uh, all kinds of uh, status related books. And just to end off, I want to show you other ways that we're thinking about uh, recovering uh, this content, recovering the literary uh, heroes of our nation, recovering our story. We're doing um, other smaller projects. Uh, this map, Sajrof, has a zine that we produced in two weeks, uh, writing, uh, sort of summarizing uh, writing from Tinashe's uh, dissertation that was based on Dabuza Marisha and Percy Shelley. He was writing about anarchism and romanticism in tandem. I really love the way he brought these two characters from different uh, time periods together and different cultures. Um, we took photographs in the city center. We used images from the archive of Damuzo, Maechera's um, 
papers that's held at Humboldt University in Germany, um, which is also another part of the story. Can we uh, get to the deposits uh, that do exist um, of the, the stories of our literary heroes? And we started to think about his biography and also urban myth and plot out um, on the map of our city center places that he would spend time and hang out, sort of like reimagining the, the landscape of the city as well, reinscribing uh, him back into that space, a character that is kind of, we've been asked to shun and asked to forget about uh, by the authorities. Um, I think everyone should try to read something by Marichera. He was inspired by the beat poets and is this really dynamic, uh, kind of crazy, thrilling um, pace of his work is so inspiring to us. Um, and then just to close off, uh, Black Chalk is trying to do a lot of different kinds of work, thinking about presenting literary work through exhibitions, through conversations, through presentations like this. Um, I'm not sure if we're going to go back into uh, type design as of yet, but we're definitely thinking about commissioning more conceptual projects that grapple with the idea of these um, gaps and uh, limitations of language and representation within our space and the power dynamics that touch us. Uh, what we are working on right now is a publication called Some Writers Can Give You Two Heartbeats. Uh, this is... Um, uh, spread from it uh, an, uh, an imaginary conversation between Tinashe, my collaborator, and Dambuzo Marichera. Um, this publication brings together um, excerpts of interviews by authors and puts them in conversation with each other, takes out uh, the interviewer's voice, who's often not a uh, Zimbabwean, so a voice coming to tease out uh, content and uh, often stands between uh, the, uh, the characters within the book, the authors. And so it's kind of a moment uh, of our imagination, aspiration to have our voices all together, sort of speaking and reinforcing or talking about the complexity and diversity of our experience and histories. Uh, we also launched an exhibition called Beautiful Words Are Subversive, and that's uh, up at uh, VCU Arts. It opened this week, where we're thinking about the work that we have done. Uh, we've got a new publication called South of Samora, which talks about the invisible divide between the classes uh, in Zimbabwe, um, and it's all through this one street named after the first black president of Mozambique, who was very influential in helping uh, orchestrate our independence struggle. That's Tinashe there. Uh, that's the zine that made the map. And this is an excerpt from this publication, which uses those quotes, archival photographs, um, newspaper clippings, and any other ephemera that we've been able to gather uh, from literary organizations, from authors themselves, uh, from our sort of musing. And just like uh, last couple of slides, this is our starting to work on uh, beautiful words, our subversive. Uh, this is a drawing on the back of the Zimbabwe Writer series by Tracy Dunn, one of the illustrators that uh, worked, I think she was working for Mambo Press on this one. Mambo Press was uh, run by Jesuit priests, so I think it's quite fascinating. And the cover of Some Writers Can Give You Two Heartbeats. Um, all of the uh, texts by the authors, their voices are organized by theme uh, with sub themes. And so you really get a sense um, of this kind of projecting and trying to bring fragments uh, together that traces throughout all of our work. And it's uh, just a continual scavenger hunt and a question of who done it, but also trying to present uh, the trail for other people to continue to follow. Thank you. <laughs>